Testament book of uh, Song of Songs, and if, uh, if you have a Bible with you, you can open uh, to Song of Songs. Uh, if you don't know where it is, if you go to the middle of your Bible, is uh, the book of Psalms. In just three books to the right, you have Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes, then Song of Songs. And we are in uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 8, and we'll be reading to the end of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little ones. That the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He grazes among the lilies until the day breathes, and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on a cleft mountain. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for your, your holy word uh, that speaks to us of, of such wonders. And it is your grace that you have revealed yourself to us, not only who you are, but your, your purposes in, in the world and through history and your purposes in our lives. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit would uh, illumine our minds, that we would be able to understand your word and that he would lead us to our Savior, Jesus, who is is our hope and our salvation. And uh, so we pray that you would be our teacher now, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is our uh, fourth sermon in uh, the series on uh, Song of Songs or Song of, of Solomon that we've been studying. And, and as we've been going through this series, I've mentioned a few times that, that there's basically two different ways of reading the book of Song of Songs. One's kind of the more literal reading that the Song of Songs is a collection of love poems about a young man, a young woman who fall in love and they, they come together and they get married. Or there's another interpretation that says, well, okay, the deeper meaning of Song of Songs is it's really an allegory about God's relationship to his people, about Christ and the church. And if you've been with us for the first three sermons in the series, we've, the first three, we've focused on the more kind of romantic reading and the lessons that we can learn about romantic love from this book of wisdom. Well, uh, today I want to give uh, a sermon exclusively on what this passage says about our relationship to the Lord. And so our theme today is waiting for the Lord, waiting on the Lord, and specifically uh, waiting for Jesus uh, to come again and to make all things new. That's uh, one of the the basic uh, uh, Christian beliefs is that uh, Jesus Christ is in heaven and he will one day come Uh, to set all things right in his creation, and God will come and dwell with humanity in a renewed creation. That's one of the things we're waiting for. And uh, historically, uh, commentators have seen this passage that I just read as an allegory about the coming of the Lord. You see how it begins there in verse 8, where it says, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. And I love this image of Jesus' second coming, that he's like a gazelle that's bounding over the hills, and he comes prancing over the hills to us. And it's, there's something kind of uh, jovial about that and, and lively. And uh, what happens when Jesus comes like a gazelle bouncing over the mountains? Well, the image in the passage is that the winter is over, and now the, the spring and the summer have come. And you see that there in verse 11, how it says, For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. 
the time of singing has come. And for those of you who love C.S. Lewis, you, you'll know that uh, this is an image that he used in his uh, Narnia stories. Uh, in the Narnia stories, Aslan, when Aslan comes, who's the Christ figure, he ends the long winter and he begins the time of spring and summer and, you know, sets Narnia free from the curse. And so the woman in the poem represents the church waiting for her beloved Christ who comes to end the long cold winter and leads us into an endless spring and summer of the world to come. And so this is a passage about waiting for the Lord. It's what the Christian life is about, waiting for the Lord. So what does it teach us? Well, this morning I just want to point out three lessons about how we wait for the Lord from this passage. And this is what they are. That we wait by worshiping, we wait by seeing through a glass darkly, and we wait, we wait by trusting in God's covenant. How do we wait for the Lord? Three things. We wait by worshiping, by seeing through a glass darkly, and we wait by trusting in God's covenant. And I'll tell you, this applies uh, not just to all of us waiting till the end of history when Jesus will come again, but all of us are waiting for various things in our lives. You have prayers that you are waiting to be answered, or you might be single and you're waiting for a spouse, or, or you may be waiting for God to provide for you in some way in your life. Whatever you're waiting for, I think all these principles apply for how we wait as God's people for him to do what he is going to do in his own timing. So, how do we wait for the Lord? Three lessons this morning. The first is this. We wait by worshiping. We wait by worshiping. What we're doing right now, week in and week out, we come to church and we gather as God's people. And even though who knows when Jesus is going to come, he, the Bible says he's going to delay his coming. And so uh, it says in other places he's coming soon. In some places it says he's going to delay. And so as we wait, we don't know when he's coming. Week in and week out, we gather together before him and we worship. And why is worship so important? Well, three things that we see in this passage happen when we gather here for worship. The first is that in worship, we hear God's voice. It's one of the most important things while you're waiting is to hear God's voice. God speaks to us from his word. And one of the things that commentators throughout history have observed about this passage is that Jesus' word precedes his coming. His voice comes before his body shows up. And uh, you see that there in verse 8. It starts by saying, the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes. And so apparently the woman in this passage, she couldn't see her beloved coming, but she heard his voice first, and then he arrived. And that's how the Christian life works. You have to be willing to hear God's voice before you see him. Uh, you have to hear his voice before you see him. That happens over and again. That's a theme that comes up over and over throughout the scriptures. And Many people expect it to be just the opposite. Many people say, well, if, you know, I can't see the God of the Bible. If I could see him, if I could see the miracles, if I could see Jesus, then I will believe the word. I want to see, and then I'll be willing to hear what God has to say. But whenever we say that, that I want to see it, I want to see the evidence first. It means that our confidence is in our own minds. Our own, the evidence that we will be the judges, and if it passes the test of us seeing, then we'll be willing to listen and trust. And the Lord says it's not going to be that way. Because you're never going to be able to see everything or understand everything about God. So you're going to have to take his word for it. And the Lord speaks to us. And as we wait, we need to learn to listen to his word and trust that it's good. And believe what he says. And even when he says things that are strange, things that seem strange to us, we trust what he says to us. And so we wait by worshiping first because in worship, we learn to hear God's voice and his word. Okay? Second thing that happens in worship is in worship, we join in the song of all creation. In worship, we join in the song of all creation. And actually, we just what we did a few moments ago where we're all singing together, there's no other time in our week where we experience something like that, where we gather with such a group of people and our voices are joined together to praise God. And you see the mention of song in this passage. You see in verse 12 there, when the winter turns into spring, and then it says in verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. 
And the picture is that when the spring comes, all of nature starts singing. You know, the turtle doves are singing. And, uh, and there's other places in the Old Testament which talks about all of nature bursting into song when the Lord comes. Let me read to you one example. This is uh, Psalm 98, verses 4 to 8. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. It's a great image. The oceans are singing and then all the fishes and the whales and everything are singing to the Lord. They're roaring with praise to him. The world and those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. All nature sings of the Lord's coming. And so when we sing together in worship, what we're doing is we're anticipating that great chorus that's going to happen one day when the whole creation bursts into song. We're having a little foretaste. A preview is happening right here in this little gathering as we uh, lift our voices to the Lord. And if I could just... uh, make a side comment here. We were thinking of putting this in the announcements, but it fit so perfectly here in this sermon. Uh, Something that we believe in as a church is an essential part of discipleship. Being a follower of Jesus is learning to sing. And, uh, you know, it's commanded many places in the scripture. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells the Christians in the churches, you know, sing to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, which means that we have to learn to sing. And our, our vision for this church would be that if a visitor came in and joined our worship service, they would hear us singing and say, these people really believe this. You know, actually there's a great, uh, 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 Psalm 22 uh, says that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. The sound that fills this room when we praise, in some way the Lord dwells in that sound. And so our voices matter. They they minister to one another, and they make this experience so much more rich. And so we need to learn to sing. And of course, one of the ways we've been doing that is we have uh, Ava Vroom, our music director, has been having monthly hymn sings where we come on Sunday evening, and this last time we had a potluck, and then we learned to sing a hymn, the one that we just sang, the Psalm 103. And uh, and then Ava's also uh, gone further than that. She designed some uh, songbooks for us. So they're actually out in the lobby. When you're going out, you can get some songbooks, three per family. And if you want more than that, you can just sign up and we'll print as many as you want for your home. And this is so that maybe after dinner or if you have some people from church over or you have a home group or a D group or something like that, you can sing together. And the hope would be that singing would become a part of our culture. We live in a culture where we have professionals who sing for us and we listen to them do it. Humans throughout history have not done that. Singing is a human activity where, and especially for Christians, we are anticipating the day where Jesus will come to make all things new and so we are a singing people. So in worship, we come and we hear God's voice. We need to hear his voice before we see him. But also in worship, we join with all creation in praise to our creator. And, uh, you know, I just want to make one, one uh, note about that. You know, learning to sing, songs get so deep into our psyche. I mean, some of you will have known uh, people that had uh, dementia, that grew up singing hymns in the church or singing in their homes, and they, they can't even remember the names of their children, and they can't even function, but they can still sing songs that were in their hearts. And actually, after the first service, uh, Carrie Duffy came up to me and was telling me her, about her grandma who had sung gospel hymns all through her childhood. And at the end of her life, she was in a coma. And she was brought home by hospice to to die at home. And she never woke up from this coma. But even while she was in a coma, she would all of a sudden just open her eyes and she would start singing gospel hymns while she was still in a coma. That's how deep those songs were in her. God has given us music to powerfully bring his grace into our hearts. So, and worship we join with all creation in singing. Okay, the third thing in worship is also in worship, we are set free from our sins. And you see in this passage, even though, you know, this passage is all about the spring has come and, you know, the turtle doves are singing and the flowers are blossoming and all this, then there's this strange verse where it says in verse 15, catch the foxes for us. 
The little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. And the foxes are an image for our sins. You know, as we wait for the Lord, there are foxes in the church, there are foxes in our individual lives that want to keep us from communion with the Lord. And it's interesting that the woman says this to the Lord. She says her vineyard is being spoiled by foxes, but it's him. He's the one who comes and catches the foxes and and searches them out. And it's part of God's grace to us to search out the foxes, to confront the foxes in our lives, and he's the one who catches them and cleanses us and forgives us and washes us. And that's why the beginning of every service, when we come together in worship, what do we do? We, we say, Lord, we're going to confess our sins. We bow down before you and say, Lord, we still have sin in our lives. Will you free us and wash us? And he does this, okay? So how do we wait for the Lord? The, the first thing is that over the years, over the decades, week by week, We gather as God's people and worship, and we meet with him. We hear his voice. We we learn to sing with all nature, and the Lord catches the little fox sins that are keeping us from trusting him. But even as we come here, you know, many of you will feel that, that we know God is present with us. Jesus says he's with us here, but we don't always experience that. He seems distant to us, even when we're gathered with God's people. And so a second thing that we learn about waiting is that we wait by seeing through a glass darkly. So we wait by worshiping. That's the pattern of of waiting. But we also recognize we wait for the Lord by seeing through a glass darkly. And what happens in this passage, so, you know, the Lord comes bounding over the hills like a gazelle, and he's coming to his beloved, and he comes to her house. And it's like she's kind of in this enclosed area in this house, and he's approaching from the outside. And you see what it says in the second part of verse 9 there? It says, Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. And so she's in some enclosed area, and the Lord comes bounding like a gazelle, and he's looking through the lattice, and he's wanting to see her, and they're wanting to see each other, but, you know, they can only kind of partially see each other's faces. They want to see one another, but they can't see one another. They're kind of, there's a wall between them. There's a window between them. And it reminds me of those words from uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where the Apostle Paul says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And what both these passages are talking about is how even though the Lord is here and we worship him, yet we don't see him face to face yet. It's only through a glass darkly and in a mirror dimly or through the openings of a lattice. And that experience of feeling like we long for the Lord but we can't quite see him does two things that I want to point out from this passage, okay? The first is that it makes us long for a distant country. When we only behold the Lord kind of dimly, you know, in the, through a glass darkly, it makes us long for a distant country. And you see what happens there in verse 10, where it says, My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. And so she's inside this enclosed area, and he's on the outside. He's been up in the mountains hiking, whatever he's been doing, and he comes and he says, Come out of your house and come with me to go explore the mountains together into the wild country. And, uh, and what's interesting to me is that in this image, the place where the Lord is, is way bigger than the place where the woman is. And I think for many of us, I've heard people say this about heaven, like the heavenly country, when they long for heaven, they say, you know, this world is so amazing. And it's like, we think this earth is so vast, and there's so many different habitats, and so many things to see, and then that's, the universe is so vast. And then we have these pictures in our head of heaven, and you say, well, what's heaven? It's like a cloud's and it's pink or something, and there's angels bouncing around, and there's a castle or something. And it seems so small. And in, so many people say, I, I'd rather be here forever than being in heaven forever. Because it seems so small and different. And this passage is saying, no, it's just the opposite. What you've experienced in this world is just the enclosed little house. The heavenly country is so much more vast, so much more beyond our wildest wildest dreams, and the Lord is calling us into that country. Uh, It is like a vast and wild mountain range. And I mentioned uh, C.S. Lewis at the beginning of this this sermon, and and C.S. Lewis, this is one of his favorite themes, is kind of the distant country, the homeland that, that is our eternal home when we are in Christ. 
And he has a, a famous passage from Mere Christianity where he talks about our longing for this distant country. I want to read to you a couple paragraphs from this. This is what he says. Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and, and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And then he goes on later to say, probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it. It's only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings. And on the other hand, never to mistake them for this something else to which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. Basically what he's saying is everything that we love about this world is just a shadow. It's just a copy. It's a picture and the real thing is in the heavenly country. He says, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. That other country is the place where Jesus, like a gazelle, is bouncing around in those mountains and calling us out to come join him and to be a part of it. And I think one thing that's important to say about that is that I think sometimes, you know, Christians start thinking about the life to come and they say, oh, yeah, it's going to be so amazing in the new creation. And it's like, I want to travel and I want to see, you know, I didn't get a chance to travel much in this life and I'm going to get to go see all the wonders of the world and I'm going to eat amazing food and I'm going to have close friendships that I've just longed for in this life and I'm going to finally be myself. And of course, that is all true, amazingly promised in the gospel. But... That is not the best thing about that heavenly country. And so waiting, seeing through a dark glass, on the one hand, it makes us long for a distant country, for a homeland. But even more than that is a second thing, is that it makes us long to see God's face. That is the great blessing, is we will behold our God. And that verse from 1 Corinthians 13 says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. That's the great longing of the church in this passage. Look at verse 14, what it says. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And that theme of human beings come, coming face to face with their creator is a theme that runs throughout the scriptures. Let me just give you a couple. Psalm 27, 8 says, You have said... Seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Or even in the final chapter of the Bible, Re uh, Revelation chapter 22, which describes the great city of the, of the new creation, the, the heavenly Jerusalem that's come down into the earth. And there's this great city where God dwells. And after all the descriptions of that city, the, the, the most beautiful thing about being a part of that city is it says they will see his face. Waiting now makes us long for the distant country and even more makes us long to see God's face. Now I'll tell you, there's a question that I have about this. I'm not sure I know the answer. But there is a question, how can you see God's face? I mean, the Bible tells us God is invisible. He's, you know, mortal invisible. And you, you can't see God. And actually, even in Exodus uh, 33.20, the Lord says to Moses, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So there's some mystery here. It's a riddle. Uh, but somehow we are going to behold the face of the Lord and not die. And I will tell you, there is nothing more dangerous. There is nothing more thrilling that you will ever experience in all of your existence when you as a creature will come face to face with your creator. He will see, he knows every thought about you. He knows he created you good. He knows you and loves you. And it is that knowing God, we actually come to be our true selves. And that's one of the things I love about this passage where, you know, Jesus comes 
bouncing like a gazelle, saying, why don't you come out of your enclosed garden and come run through the hills with me? And one commentator says that this woman in this passage, it's like she has a shyness to her. And she's uh, losing her shyness as she comes to know her beloved. And it's like we all know that we have a shyness to us. There's something hidden. And it's not until we come face to face with our creator that not only do we know him as he really is, but we are known as we really are and we become our true selves. This is the great thrill of being human and what is offered to us in the gospel. It's the hope of the Christian. And this is what's worth waiting for as we wait through all the trials of this life. And so how do we wait? First, we wait by worshiping the week in and week out rhythm of what we are doing right now to meet with our God, to hear his voice, to join with the song that's going to be all of nature at the end of history, and to let him chase out the foxes of our sins. But second, we wait by seeing through a glass darkly, which makes us long for the distant country, our true homeland. And the best thing about that homeland is that we will meet God face to face. But there's one more thing that I want to point out from this passage, okay, about waiting. And it's that we wait by trusting in God's covenant. We wait by trusting in God's covenant. If you don't know the language of the covenant, covenant is the word that the Bible uses to describe the kind of relationship that we have with God. And a covenant is a relationship of love, but it's a relationship that also has promises attached to it and, and obligations and that God has promised himself to us like in a marriage. And there's this binding together of two people. It's an amazing thing in the Bible that God binds himself to us with promises. And one of the things that you can see in this passage, you'll notice that, um, that this song kind of begins and ends with the same images. Uh, verse 8 starts talking about mountains, gazelles, and young stags. And then when you get down to the end of the passage in verse 17... It says, until the day breathes and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on, uh, on cleft mountains. And so this is called an inclusio, where you see, use the same words at the beginning, same words at the end. And Song of Songs is a collection of songs that have been put to, strung together into one song. And so this is kind of its own unit. And right before you come to the ending, the second part of the inclusio, we read the defining words of God's covenant in verse 16. My beloved is mine, and I am his. This is the promise of God that he says that we are his, and he is ours. And this is the, the word that the Lord uses to renew his covenant throughout the Old Testament, that he says to his people, I will be your God, and you will be my people. I will be your God, you will be my people. It's that binding together, and it's like a marriage vow. That's what that is. And, uh, and so the way you wait is by trusting in the promises of God's covenant that he will do what he says. And what we learn in the New Testament is that all of God's covenant promises from the Old Testament are ultimately fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came in his first coming and when he comes in his second coming. And so in the Garden of Eden, when God promises and he says, there is going to be a child born of a woman who is going to come and crush the head of the serpent and undo everything that the evil one has done. Jesus comes as the son of the woman who comes in, in it, on the cross. He defeats sin and death and Satan. And then when he comes on the last day, he will rid the world of all evil and wipe away every tear from our eyes. Or when God promised to Abraham that in Abraham's offspring, all the families of the earth will find blessing. Jesus comes as the offspring of David, and he has now gathered people from, who are worshiping like us in every nation. And the, the people who have been believers throughout history are billions of people, like far, more than you can, the stars you can see in the visible sky, far exceeding the promise that God made to Abraham. And then God promised to Moses, I'm going to come dwell among my people, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide sacrifices, the blood sacrifices to wash away their sin. Jesus comes as God dwelling among us, not just in a tent like with Moses, but in flesh and blood. He walked among us and then became the true Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, not just of the Israelite people, but of all nations. And then God promised to David there's going to be an eternal kingdom. These are all the promises of the covenant. And Jesus comes as the descendant of David who now has a kingdom that's 2,000 years old. It will extend to the end of this age and in all, 
into eternity, into the age to come, and Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He's been given all authority in heaven and earth. The promises of God have proven true in Jesus Christ. And lastly, God promised to Jeremiah a new covenant where it was not only God would pour blessings on us, but he would reach inside our hearts and take our hearts of stone and give us new hearts that actually love him. And Jesus has done that. He says that in, through his body and blood, through his blood is the blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. The promises of God have proven true in Jesus Christ. And so all of God's promises find their yes in him. And so waiting is about trusting in Christ. It is him that we worship. We hear his voice in the word. We praise him in our songs. We go to him to take away the foxes of our sin. And in that distant country, we long to see him. And he is actually the answer to the riddle of how are you going to see God's face? You will see the glory of the Lord in the face of Jesus Christ. He answers all the riddles and fulfills all the promises of the Bible. And as we behold his glory and beauty, we find that God's covenant promises are more sure than anything that we will experience in this world. And so as we wait, whatever you're waiting for, whatever you're waiting through, whatever trial you're waiting through right now, it's with confidence that we say to our Savior, my beloved is mine and I'm his and I will always be his forever. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we uh, thank you for this beautiful passage, all the images in every verse of Song of Songs that teaches us about the wonders of your love. And Lord, I pray for us as a congregation that you would make us a people who patiently wait and Lord, you know all the, the trials that make waiting difficult for each one of us here in this room. Lord, as we come before you week after week in worship, would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us? Would we encourage one another? And Lord, would you make, mo make our longings for that distant country, for that new homeland, even stronger in us, that even as we behold you um, in a mirror dimly, would we know for certain we will one day see you face to face. We, we look forward to that day. We thank you for these great promises in Jesus' name.